Here's the figure I really want you to concentrate on. This is the kind of figure that you could see on an exam, like a final exam, and it might be missing all of its arrows, and it might even be missing some of its features, and I expect you to be able to draw them in. I expect you to demonstrate to me that you understand the phenomenon of El Nino and La Nina and how it relates to changes in air pressure and how it changes the depth of the thermocline in the eastern versus western Pacific. So here's the part to really pay close attention. Normally, this would be Lenata conditions. Air pressure is higher in Papeete Tahiti than Darwin, Australia because we have higher pressure here and lower pressure here then winds are going to flow from Papeete Tahiti to Darwin, Australia. These are the normal trade winds that we would <clears throat> that we just talked about in the global atmospheric circulation. We talked about winds generally flowing from east to west across the equatorial Pacific. In doing so, most of the warm water is also is confined to the western Pacific. We have winds moving this way because these winds are moving this way, they're actually causing upwelling. So colder water at least in the eastern Pacific and we have warm water also because it's this water coming from north and south is a little bit cooler and as it travels along the equator it warms up so most of the warm water the pool of warm water we find in the western Pacific this pool of warm water gives rise to clouds cumulonimbus convection and storm systems and thunderstorms and rain and this greatly influences the weather of Indonesia under normal normal conditions. Of course we have to have a return path and so the return path for air circulation is in the upper atmosphere and so this is an idealized circulation pattern for the Pacific Ocean something called the Walker circulation. Air moving east to west along the surface moving west to east aloft descending here and creating this normal pattern of trade winds that we normally see. Higher pressure Tahiti lower pressure Australia. You can also see the distribution of the thermocline both because winds are blowing across here creating uh, equatorial upwelling and because of heating in the western Pacific the thermocline is very deep in the western Pacific and more shallow in the eastern Pacific where we live. Okay? If we have really strong air pressure, really high air pressure here or really low air pressure here if we have a very positive southern oscillation index then these trade winds blow even stronger and this warm water is shifted even more towards the west and we have even more equatorial upwelling and an even shallower thermocline. So La Nina is essentially strong normal conditions and this is what we're experiencing or had experienced over the last couple of years in Southern California it's really pushed our source of rain further towards the west and that's why it's really dried out in Southern California. We've experienced at least a couple years due to La Nina drought. We've also experienced drought because of something I'll talk about a little bit in a few minutes but this alters weather patterns over Southern California because now all the source of rain in essence has been pushed towards the west. Again a simplified model of it. You see cooler water at the equator, you see more upwelling both uh, off of our coast as well, colder water, um, when these trade winds blow even more strongly from east to west. El Nino, El Nino is just the opposite. The whole system breaks down so to speak. Trade winds relax, the air pressure between Papeete and Darwin switches so we may have higher pressure here and lower pressure here or nearly the same pressure trade winds start to blow in the opposite direction and that's one of the first indicators of an El Nino because trade winds begin to blow in an opposite direction and interestingly enough if you go back to the journals of Captain Cook who spent a lot of time in the South Pacific Islands the wayfaring people the people that colonized all the islands of the South Pacific Ocean were aware that occasionally the trade winds will blow in the opposite direction. And when that began to happen, they'd load up their boats and they would just go. They would just go with the trade winds as far as they could in the opposite direction. And they were extremely skilled navigators, probably the most skilled navigators that ever have existed 
on the ocean. They just have a boat, the stars, the waves, flotsam and jetsam to look at, and no GPS, no other way of navigating, and they got around all over the ocean with no problems. But they would go traveling as far as the reverse trade winds would take them, knowing that eventually the trade winds would come back and bring them back towards their home. So without fear, they could leave and head out and explore new territories, explore new places to live, find a new island to live on, maybe an island with more resources, uh, maybe to get away from their family or neighbors, who knows. And then knowing that the trade winds would eventually switch back to their normal condition, they could come back safely home and tell people about what they found. Well, that's a phenomenon known as El Nino. So it was really known to people long before scientists ever really became aware of it or studied it. And here's what happens. The trade winds relax or reverse. The pool of warm water goes all the way across the Pacific Ocean. It really sloshes back in something called a Kelvin wave that, come, that propagates eastward, this warm water. At the same time, because this warm water is now um, spreading across the Western Pacific Ocean as well, we have a lot more cumulonimbus convection. We have a lot more thunderstorm activity, a lot more evaporation and storm activity. Southern California gets drenched. We have extreme storms, and most of us associate El Ninos with lots of rain, lots of storms, mudslides. Some of the most dangerous and really deadly uh, events that we have weather-wise at least um, occur due to El, Win El Nino. Winds pick up, waves knock piers down, they knock coastal uh, development down. We have houses and structures sliding off the hills from the extreme flooding that occurs during El Nino. And here's why. We have this huge pump of moisture uh, as this warm water slides back across the Pacific Ocean as trade winds relax or trade winds even reverse, pushing warm water. You can see what it does to the thermocline as well. It deepens the thermocline, effectively putting a lid on the ocean. Here's the Peruvian fishermen with their warm water, no upwelling, no nutrients, no phytoplankton, no fish, no way to eat. Okay, and so this is the warm water due to El Nino shutting down fisheries because the thermocline is deepened. All the source of nutrient-rich water is now much deeper and doesn't make it to the surface. So reverse the trade winds, reverse in air pressure, a spreading of warm water across the western Pacific, a deepening of the thermocline in the eastern Pacific, and eventually a shutdown of fisheries. During the extreme El Nino in 1983, the Galapagos Islands, which are just off the coast here, um, saw 80% reduction in penguin populations and other severe losses of wildlife because all their source of food and all their sources of cold water were cut off. So again, has very major consequences for weather when this happens. But if you go back and compare the normal condition, the La Nina condition, and the El Nino condition, a negative southern oscillation index, you can begin to see how this phenomenon, both in air pressure differences, sea surface temperatures, depth of thermocline, wind patterns, storm patterns, how each of these conditions lead to a different set of variables or a different set of conditions on in different places on at least where we live and in other parts of the world. So study these three figures and make sure you understand what's going on with each of the variables that I just talked about.